Hey guys, welcome to The Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Now today we're going to be looking at some film and some pictures of a fish that I think is really underrated, that's not talked about a ton in the hobby, and it's a cold water fish that you can keep without a heater, but it also can tolerate semi-warm water too, uh, up to 70 degrees or so. Uh, but it does prefer around 60-degree uh, water. But this fish is called the three-spined stickleback. And what you're seeing is a bunch of babies and then a, a female that's pregnant. And I took this film up at Harrison Lake in uh, uh, Vancouver, Canada, in British Columbia. Uh, so it's just outside of Vancouver, about an hour. But... I just was mesmerized by watching them swim around, and I knew of stickleback, I knew what they were, but I'd never thought of them as an aquarium species, and I began to look at them and watch them and think, man, they're actually pretty interesting. They do these flashing things on their side where they signal to one another, uh, they have a little dance signal for danger, a dance signal for food, and they're just a really dynamic and interesting fish. Pardon the wobbliness of this film. Now, they're, uh, they've been introduced to a lot of lakes, and they're, they're really hardy, and they historically have been able to go in and out of salt water. So they're, uh, they're a fish kind of similar to a salmon or something like that as far as their abilities. But way different lineage. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is their evolutionary uh, quirks, and we're just going to touch on a couple. And basically what I wanted to talk about is how they have evolved to change within very few generations and look like completely different fish. So... Uh, this footage, you guys may have seen it in the past uh, in Vancouver, Canada, uh, as I was saying, where I was out in the woods uh, taking some footage in the streams, creeks, rivers. Uh, so this is right off of uh, Harrison Lake, as I said, but it's also off of the Fraser River. And so the stickleback were in the Fraser River and then made their way up into the lake, it, it, it would be guessed. But they have found ways to survive in this lake, which has a hot spring. And so that hot spring has water that's, you know, 80, 90 degrees, and you'll still see them swimming around as well as uh, pumpkin seed fish and bluegills and sunfish and things like that. Uh, now, all of these fish that I'm just talking about, surprisingly, have quirks that are really similar to cichlids. So let's let's get a closer look at the fish. So all these fish, I'm just using a Google search, obviously. I'm sorry if it's a little low budget, but uh, naturally this is usually uh, what the fish would look like, something like this illustrated version uh, right here. And they have uh, three spines, generally the three spines stickleback, and sometimes uh, the third spine is very small and not very pronounced. Other times the spines are downright, you know, intense, and the fin isn't anywhere near them, and they look like thorns, and the fish is skinny. So... In one lake, you'll find, in, you know, a 15, 20 mile long lake, you'll find a set of stickleback that maybe there's a population at the inflow and the outflow, and they can look totally different from one another as far as coloration, armor plating versus just light scales. Um, and in my home town, my home state, and the closest body of water to my house, actually, uh, Lake Washington, they've been studying the stickleback for years and years. There's been an ongoing study through the University of Washington. Here's some surveyed stuff. Um, but what I wanted to show you guys, uh, it, which is the most interesting to me, 
is when you actually search for Lake Washington stickleback. So first I'm going to show you this is what the fish looked like when they started the study. 1957 in March they started studying these fish. Now Lake Washington had tons of industrial chemicals in it. It had creosote and just gasoline, diesel, just terrible stuff in it. It had been heavily logged and then houses had been built along the edges. And not only that, but the inflow streams had been either dammed or diverted and wastewater from neighborhoods and things washed straight into the lake. So the lake was downright toxic. They advised people not to swim in it by the early 1960s. When my parents were growing up, they recalled be not going in the lake certain times a year and things. So <clears throat> the visibility in the lake at that time was half a foot. And this is in a freshwater lake. So half a foot, that's how murky and algae bloomed and just troubled the lake was. And the fish, when they started the survey, looked like this. They had uh, a little bit of armor uh, up top, right here by their head. And then they had the spines. And then for the most part, they were this kind of muddy, see-through brown. Uh, kind of looks like dirty water, really. And here, this is just coloration. But you can see this uh, flap here. This is the start of armor, but it's not fully, it's it's not a full plate, as we'd say. So you can see part of a plate over the gill and part of a plate by the, the fish's pectoral fin. Uh, and that's how they were then. And this is when predators couldn't see them in the water. So move to today, and this is what stickleback look like. This is a completely armored stickleback. So every one of these little ribbed markings is a plate of flexible armor, like you'd find on catfish. And you can see that the, the spines on it are much less angular and much straight up. So bigger fish are chomping down, and rather than small fish getting the, the stickleback caught in its throat, as these uh, more inclined angles would show, now the fish has spines headed straight up, so or almost straight up. So that also shows that the angle of attack has changed. So we're talking in the course of 60 years here that a fish went from a scaleless, translucent tan cream colored fish with some of them having brown on their heads and things others not to this armored uh, auburn red fish uh, some of them are green also and the mystery is what gives what happened well they cleaned up the lake and so by 1969 they noticed that 30 percent of sticklebacks had armor reaching back to their spines just within 10 years. Now these fish mate every year and they become old enough to reproduce uh, on their own within a year, much before a year actually. So you're able to see rapid evolution going on in this species. And as I was saying, they already knew that the sticklebacks in say a crystal clear inflow from a glacier or from a really clear, slow-moving stream or river had a kind of a camouflage marking, whereas the ones out in the open water uh, had less so, more just a, a single solid color with some maybe some marbling or modeling, some spots. And uh, so if we go and we look at just general pictures of sticklebacks again, you can see that these ones would be the ones that you would find at the in the clearer waters. And these guys here, you'd find in the swampy reed areas where they've got the stripes and the yellow on their belly and the green on their top. 
whereas open water looks something like this. Now all these are still armored though, and that's because when they cleaned up the lake, there was literally a, a complete correlation. So you could say, I want a 50% covered in armor stickleback, and you can guess on the chart what year that would be by the curve of how quickly the, the clarity in the lake changed. So as fish were able to see in the lake, the predatory fish that ate these fish actually became, you know, it became harder for them to eat these fish because they evolved so quickly. And we're talking 50 or 60 years, you move from a fish that has sometimes these small spikes and no armor, and in this case, the coloration is uh, is very, uh, so they, like I showed you in that video, they turn on their side and flash. So it's actually really smart in that when they want to attract mates, they do a, a zigzag dance, and I'll show you that in a, in a moment here. But they flash the reflective underside, which requires iridophores and pigmentation, which require vitamins, minerals, and a good diet to uh, keep up that, as well as uh, it can turn colors when they're spawning, like red and uh, green, de depending on the stickleback and the region. Uh, they just have different traits. And that's because they have such quick evolution. And if any of you guys have been following in the news, there was recently a female stickleback that had been alone for a super long time, and she gave birth without, to their knowledge, ever being around a male stickleback. And so they were trying to figure out what happened, and finally after three years they figured it out. But she was bloated, and she had fertilized eggs inside of her rather than laying eggs as stickleback usually do. Usually a stickleback will lay eggs in a nest that their partner has prepared. Sorry, my, my mouth was dry. I had to get a little sip of water there. But, so, these fish are really fascinating fish if you wanted to keep them in your aquarium. I'm going to give credit to the Environmental Agency TV here. Um, but I just wanted... I'll just play this footage while uh, we chat about the last bits and pieces of this. But what you see here is a male, and he's collecting threads and different materials. And basically, he picks them up and then drops them to make sure that they have the buoyancy he wants and the qualities he wants. And then he uses his, his spit, which has an enzyme in it and a protein that causes it to be sticky and to solidify. Uh, when in contact with water, and he builds this nest that's uh, kind of funnel-shaped, almost like a fish trap, and you'll see him doing that in this video, and then what he does is he convinces the female uh, to get into the nest by showing off that bright underside, the silver on him. Now, these are probably open water uh, sticklebacks in water that's not very uh, transparent. So you can guess that by just looking at the fish. It's not heavily armored. Its spikes are at an angle, so it's probably a smaller body of water, maybe a pond or a creek. And then it's just kind of normal, reflective, greenish-brown water colors uh, with some silver and a little bit of red and blue on the belly uh, to show off during mating. So... The female gets pushed through this trap, which is basically, so the nest he's building, he's got a nest exit here and an entrance here, and uh, yeah, the subtitles are showing that he's gluing. So he'll enter the nest here, and he swims through and comes out here. So when she does that, she gets stuck. She's a little bit fatter than him, and uh, predictably so, he'll, he'll court her just like a cichlid would. Uh, and they follow each other, they do these dances, the males compete, they headbutt each other and do all sorts of fighting things, and then show off their flashy colors for the females. <laughs> but they need to make sure that they're not too flashy, otherwise they're just going to be bait. 
for bass or you know salmon or trout. One side note is that they move just like puffer fish when you watch them from above, the females, and they have this really irregular body with a funky tail, and so that's how the male traps them in, in his little nest. And then once he gets them stuck in the nest, lodged in there, he'll headbutt them with his nose and tap, tap, tap on either side of her belly and actually start her ovaries uh, producing or, or putting out eggs, which he'll then fertilize. So what happened is they found that female stickleback that hadn't been around males, and she had eggs inside of her that were fertilized and growing, and they she was all bloated. So they're not live-bearing fish, but what happened is she probably uh, had a wound or another fish could have been mating near her when she was very young, when her eggs were not ready and the uh, milt or the male's uh, genetic material, I'm saying it that way because YouTube keeps uh, giving me strikes for saying certain words, even if they're anatomical and biologically correct. Uh, so we'll say that, uh, they think it got lodged in there and that she then grew the eggs and they may have been too big to come out, uh, at that point, which makes you wonder, is that how live bears came to be possibly? Maybe that kept happening multiple times. Maybe it was a genetic trait, uh, that she would be able to store that and fertilize them later or whatnot. But who knows? They're studying sticklebacks a lot because they have so much variation. And even in, you know, a one square mile or one kilometer uh, pond or lake, whatever you'd like to call that, they have all these different traits and colors and uh, mating behavior. So I just thought that that video was kind of cool and that the story of cleaning up the lake in Lake Washington uh, has resulted in these nice spotted uh, kind of cool uh, camouflage colored fish with bright bellies because they can still show off uh, when they mate because now they're armored and they have those spikes and they can protect themselves against super big fish. So this is a fish that, as I said, you can keep in the home hobby. You could keep it, oops, there we go. There's Dar, uh, DWP, Darius, or is that Tozawa Tanks? Let's see here. I want to give credit where credit is due, uh, you know, when I have uh, someone popping up there. Uh, but... In any case, I just wanted to show you guys uh, the the stickleback uh, and a little bit about it. Sorry for that little side uh, interlude there of the video. Very unprofessional. Uh, uh, but I just thought this was the easiest way for me without uh, n knowing how to do all the editing and everything. Uh, very sleek. To show you, I think you guys get the picture. You guys saw my footage from Canada and uh, can see here the differences in colors. And they're a really beautiful fish. They're super easy to take care of. Uh, they do need water that is fairly neutral. But other than that, I mean, they're, they're pretty hardy. They're ponds. They live in shallow water or big lakes. But, uh, you know, they can... They can live in a lot of different conditions. They do like live food. Uh, that's that's one thing that will keep them more colorful and active. And they do nest and take care of their young. The males take care of their young. And as you can see, some of them are super, uh, super beautiful and uh, pretty. And people used to dry them out in the Pacific Northwest and take them home as trinkets, which is kind of messed up. But... They are a cool little fish. The females, like I said, look like little elongated puffer fish. And the males get all sorts of different colors and markings. So if you haven't checked them out, you have a pond or you have, uh, you know, just a cold water native tank that you're keeping. You know, maybe you've got uh, spinners or 
or something like that going on in there, uh, rainbow shiners, uh, whatever it may be that you've got, uh, bluegills, these are another great addition to a tank like that. And they can hold their own pretty well. They're, they're quick little fish, and they've got the spines and the armor if they're from the right location. So it's just pretty amazing how quickly evolution works, and it's really rewriting what we thought was possible in evolution and, and at what pace. So I hope you guys enjoyed this information. Uh, maybe I can put it together in a little more sleek uh, production uh, sort of way later. But for now, if you made it this long, uh, I would really appreciate uh, if you'd hit that like button. Also, if you're interested in more content like this and uh, the nerdy antics, just uh, subscribe and click that little bell for alerts. Other than that, uh, I'd like to hear what fish you've kept, if you've kept these, and uh, what's your favorite North American uh, fish or evolutionarily uh, quirky little fish. I'd love to hear about it. So, take care of yourselves, take care of your tanks, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.